NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Well, welcome to our monthly public talk here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. My name is Preston Dykes. Well, it's October, and Halloween is just a couple of weeks away. This is a time of year when we become acutely aware that there are things out there in the dark, <laughs> things beyond our understanding. So in the spirit of the season, we've prepared a talk for you about two of the most terrifying I mean fascinating, <laughs> mysteries of the cosmos. These are the enigmatic dark matter and dark energy. We'll have a single talk tonight in which our two speakers will share the stage, and then we'll take your questions. And if you're watching the live webcast on YouTube, we'll work in a few of your questions from the chat as well. So now to introduce our speakers. Our speakers this month are a unique pairing. Alina Kiesling and Jason Rhodes are both astrophysicists at JPL, where they are involved in a variety of exciting astronomy projects. Both have a history of using a technique called gravitational lensing to study dark matter and dark energy. She's worked on simulating it while he's worked on measuring it. But what's really special is that these two gifted researchers were pulled together by, let's call it a mutual force of attraction. You see, they just happen to be married to each other. So we think you'll enjoy their take on the dark and mysterious forces at work in the universe around us. So please welcome Jason and Alina. Thank you so much, Preston. Jason and I are so excited to be here tonight. And wow, look at this crowd. It is so big. It's very exciting. And as science-interested people, I'm sure that you can all also agree that the universe is really big. But sometimes it's hard to think about really, really big things. So let's try to put it into context a little bit for you. Let's talk about some big numbers to start with. Numbers like a million, a billion, and a trillion. There was a study done that found that 35% of people thought that these numbers were equally spaced on a number line. I can tell you that this is not correct. So if you had zero at one end of a number line that's 10 centimeters long, and you had one billion at the other end of that same number line, one million would be just one human hair width away from zero. So one million is almost nothing compared to one billion. And we can put this a little bit more into context with some things that we're all familiar with. So let's take a dime, 10 cents. I'm walking along the street, I see a dime on the ground, but I've got a bit of a sore back. I'm, I'm just, I'm not gonna pick it up. A dime compared to $100, which is a nice dinner out in Los Angeles for Jason and I. So 10 cents is almost nothing compared to that $100. And that's the same as the difference between 1 million and 1 billion. Now let's look at a larger number. So we've got $100 compared to $100,000, which is the equivalent of a down payment on a house here in Los Angeles. So the $100 is almost nothing compared to the $100,000, and this is the equivalent of one billion to one trillion. So these numbers really are very, very different to each other. The 10 cents is really insignificant compared to the $100,000, just like one million is very insignificant compared to one trillion. So now that we've got some context on the relative sizes of the numbers, we can put it into context with the universe. So when I was a kid, I thought the Earth was really big. And my parents used to take me out 
into the desert of Australia and we were looking for opals. And one day I found an opalized dinosaur bone. This was really exciting for me and it started me on my career in astrophysics. And I wanted to learn how the Earth began and evolved over time. But then I realized that I wasn't really thinking big enough. Did you know that about one million Earths would fit inside the sun, our sun. And our sun is a star. And there are around 100 billion stars in a galaxy. And there's around 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So that's 100 billion galaxies times 100 billion stars, or 10 billion trillion stars in the universe. Now that is an enormous number. I started to get an idea of just how big the universe was and I knew that I needed to understand how the universe began and evolved over time. That's how I got into astrophysics. But as Jason's going to tell you next, this 10 billion trillion stars in the universe is really just a tiny fraction of everything there is. So Alina and I are cosmologists. Those are scientists that study the contents of the universe. And when a cosmologist starts a talk, uh, he or she usually starts with this chart. The universe has a pie chart, and it's a pie because it's round. And this is the contents of the universe. And you can see that the contents of the universe are divided up into very uneven pieces, probably very unfair pieces for those kids that want the, the big piece of the pie, but maybe their brother or sister gets the, the bigger piece. But the universe is not uh, uh, given to very even pieces. The pieces that Alina was talking about, the stars here, only make up about 1% of the universe. There's a lot more gas in the universe than that. That's a few percent. And one of the things that we've found in the past few years is that almost every star, we think, has a planet. So we think that those 10 billion trillion stars that Alina was talking about in the universe probably each have at least one planet. But those planets are such a small part of the universe, they don't even show up on this pie chart. The other piece of what we call normal matter is neutrinos. Neutrinos are small, ghostly particles, billions of which pass through you every second, but you can't feel them. But we know they're there. But all the stuff I've talked about is what we call normal matter. It's the stuff we can see in the universe. It's the stuff we can detect. It's the stuff that we see with telescopes in our eyes. It's you and me. That only makes up about 5% of the universe. And we've known for the better part of a century now that most of the matter in the universe is dark matter. It's a ghostly form of matter that's not giving off light. It's not absorbing light. And that's why we call it dark matter. And when I went into graduate school in the 1990s, after college, I wanted, like Alina, to understand the contents of the universe. So I went to graduate school thinking, I'm going to figure out what this dark matter is. But a funny thing happened while I was in graduate school. Some of my colleagues, doing some work that we'll tell you about later in this talk, realized that the dark matter isn't even the biggest component of the universe. There's a bigger component of the universe that we call dark energy. So when I finished graduate school in 1999, like Alina, I realized the universe was much bigger than I thought, and I needed to think bigger. And so now I'm trying to figure out what the dark matter and the dark energy are. So we don't know what these things are. Let's talk about what we do know about them tonight. And we're going to start by talking a little bit about dark matter. Before we move on, I want to share a, a little story with you. So let's, let's take a look at what Jason's wearing here tonight. I, I came across Jason earlier with his tie, measuring it with a ruler. I was like, Jason, what are you doing? Seriously. Uh, and he said, well, Halloween theme, so I'm going to dress up as the universe. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just making sure that my tie is about 5% of my surface area. <laughs> That's what it's like being married to a cosmologist. 
So let's talk about dark matter. Back in the 1930s, here in Pasadena, California, at Caltech, a scientist named Fritz Zwicky was looking at galaxies in the sky, and he was trying to understand how they move relative to each other. And while he was observing their movements, he realized that there had to be something unseen in the universe to be causing those galaxies to be moving the way that they were. And he called this unseen, unknown component of the universe dark matter. Fast forward to the 1960s and the scientist Vera Rubin, she was looking at individual galaxies and trying to understand how their stars rotate. So if we look at our galaxy up here, we've got lots more stars in the center than we do at the outskirts. And Vera Rubin was looking at how fast those stars were rotating around. In my figure here, we're showing increasing velocity as we go up for the stars. And as we go to the right, we've got increasing distance from the center of the galaxy. What scientists expected to see at the, uh, when they first started looking at these stars was that the stars at the outskirts would be moving slower than the stars at the interior. And that's shown with this blue curve. But when Vera Rubin measured the velocities of the star, she found that they were actually moving at the same velocity no matter how far out she looked. And the only explanation for this is that there's some form of unseen dark matter holding that galaxy together because without that matter to hold the galaxy together, those stars rotating that quickly would be flung out away from the galaxy. And this is considered the first real evidence of dark matter in our universe. So fast forward a few more decades after Vera Rubin's incredibly important work, and we have a lot more evidence for dark matter. I'm showing here a baby picture of the universe. This is the universe when it was only 300,000 years old after the Big Bang, which happened 13 billion years ago. This is a map of the temperature of the universe. And in this map, you see hot and cold spots, red and blue spots. And in fact, those hot and cold spots are almost the same temperature. The difference between the hot and cold spots is only about one part in 10,000. So we had an almost uniform early universe with tiny fluctuations. And those fluctuations co corresponded to over-dense and under-dense parts of the universe. That is, parts of the universe where there was more stuff and parts of the universe where there was less stuff. And a part where there's more stuff, there's more gravity. There's more mass, there's more gravity. And those parts grew through what we call gravitational instability. They accreted stuff from around them, and they eventually became the galaxies and clusters of galaxies that we see today. So from a very early universe that was extremely uniform, we have a very clustered universe today with galaxies and clusters of galaxies, like the ones I'm showing in this picture here. This picture is one of the deepest images we've ever taken of the uh, cosmos. And this is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope called the Ultra Deep Field. This picture is a very, very small piece of the sky. If I managed to pick up that dime that Alina was talking about earlier, and I held that dime at arm's length, Roosevelt's eye would cover about the same area of the sky as this picture here. But in this picture, we're seeing 5,000 galaxies. Each of those small smudges of light there is a galaxy, much like our own Milky Way galaxy, which, as Alina told you, has 100 billion stars. So there's many, many galaxies in the sky. And what we now realize is, without the dark matter, we never would have had enough stuff for this very early uniform universe to become the very clumpy universe we see today. But keep in mind, with this picture we're seeing here, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're seeing the visible matter. We're not seeing the invisible underpart there of the iceberg. That's the dark matter holding everything together. So now I'm going to digress a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the growth of a different structure. <clears throat> this is the earliest known picture of Jason and Alina. 
It was taken about 10 years ago at a conference in Scotland where Alina was living at the time. And at this conference, uh, we were studying uh, dark matter and how to measure it. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know, but it looks to me a little bit like Alina's even ignoring me in this picture. <laughs> but like in the early universe, there was a small attraction, <laughs> I'm sure. And that attraction grew over time. And eventually, Alina moved here to JPL. And we ended up with the structure we see today. <laughs> So I'm going to now uh, switch. You're here to hear about science. So I'm going to switch back and talk about science again. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you about how we measure dark matter, since it's invisible. <clears throat> what I have here is a cartoon of how we measure dark matter. In cosmology, we measure distances with a unit called z. So we're here at z of 0. We're the observer. We're zero distance from ourselves. And here's our telescope. And we look at distant galaxies out in the universe, these distant galaxies that are of z about 1. And that might sound like a small distance, but how we do it in cosmology is a distance of 1 is actually about halfway to the edge of the visible universe. So this is a very distant galaxy. <clears throat> in the absence of anything between us and that galaxy, the light from this galaxy would take a straight path to us. But we know from the work that Vera Rubin and others did that there's all this dark matter out there in the universe. And we're particularly sensitive with this technique to dark matter that's about halfway between us and the distant galaxy. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the consequences of Einstein's theory of relativity, our theory of gravity, is that mass bends space. So what this means is the light, when it gets near this dark matter, won't take a straight path to us. That light is going to take a distorted and curved path. And I'm showing a very, very uh, exaggerated version of that here, so it's easier to see. The consequence of this is that we will not see the galaxy as it actually is. We'll see a distorted version of the galaxy. So the dark matter between us, which we can't see, has distorted our image of this distant galaxy. And in doing so, it's telling us something about the dark matter. Now, these distortions are usually quite small. But sometimes, they can be quite large. And we call this strong gravitational lensing. What I'm showing here is a picture of a galaxy cluster. All the bright spots here are nearby galaxies. And they're part of a cluster of galaxies. And that cluster has a lot of dark matter in it. It's very massive. And the consequence is that galaxies behind that cluster have their images magnified and changed by this gravitational lensing technique. So these giant arcs you see, like that, this pointer is a little tricky, like that, and all around, these giant arcs are actually very distant galaxies that would be only tiny smudges on here if it wasn't for the gravitational lensing caused by the dark matter in these galaxy clusters. So this is great evidence for dark matter. Again, we can't see it, but we can see its effect on these distant galaxies. And seeing the effect of dark matter on distant galaxies makes us as scientists really happy. <laughs> and I have, to, I have to clarify here, this is not an image that we created on our computer for this talk. This is an actual image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of strong gravitational lensing. And I think it's the universe telling us we should be happy about the clues it's giving us about dark matter. So I'm going to tell you, with one more analogy, uh, I'm going to use another analogy for how we measure dark matter. This is a penny in the pool. That's the analogy here. And full disclosure, Alina and I don't actually have a pool. So you're looking at a penny in our bathtub. But penny in the pool sounds better. So in this analogy, the penny is like the distant galaxy. And the water in our bathtub, or the water in a pool, is like the dark matter. You don't see the water here, but you know it's there because you see the effect on the image of the penny. So what's happening is the light is coming to us from the penny, and it's taking some distorted path that changes our perceived shape of the penny so that we know the water is there. 
in much the same way as the light from a distant galaxy comes to us, takes a distorted path through the dark matter, and we see a distorted image of that galaxy. But we don't see the dark matter. We don't see the water. Now, you can uh, imagine that I can't tell very much about the water in my tub from just looking at this one penny. But if I had a big pool and I threw thousands or perhaps billions of pennies at the bottom of the pool, I could tell a lot about the water in that pool by looking at how the shapes of those pennies appeared to me. I could tell the density of the water and how much water there was. And in the same way, in the 2020s, we're going to launch uh, some telescopes into space and we're going to use some telescopes on the ground that are going to measure billions of galaxy shapes across the universe. And that's going to tell us a lot about the properties of dark matter. That's how we're learning about dark matter now, and that's how we're going to learn about dark matter in the future. So we've talked a little bit about dark matter, but that's not the biggest component of the universe, as I found out when I was in graduate school, and as my colleagues found out when I was in graduate school. So we have to think bigger. So let's talk about dark energy. All right. So what's dark energy? It's Halloween, so. I have to scare you all a little bit with the equation, <laughs> but I don't want to scare you too much. So this is the only equation in our talk today, and I can reassure you it isn't actually all that difficult. This is Einstein's field equation, and it explains everything that's going on in the universe, just in this one simple equation. On the left here, this term, we've got gravity, which curves space. On the right, we have all the stuff in the universe, the matter and the energy. Now, keep in mind, this is at a time when Einstein was coming up with this, that they knew about normal matter and they knew about dark matter. So that's the kind of stuff that Einstein was thinking about. And around that time, his, Einstein and his colleagues thought that the universe was static, that is, it wasn't collapsing and it wasn't expanding. And so in order to keep the universe from collapsing in on itself under gravity because of all of the stuff in it, Einstein introduced what he called the cosmological constant. And this was supposed to hold the universe up against collapsing in on itself. Fast forward a few years and we've got uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble. He's here in Los Angeles and he's working at the Mount Wilson Telescope, which is in Los Angeles. Hubble was interested at looking at galaxies in our universe and determining what velocity that they were moving. So on this figure here, we have distance increasing away from us as we go right and velocity increasing as we go up. And what Hubble was able to see when he was looking at these galaxies is that no matter what direction he looked, the further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. And the only explanation for this is if the universe is expanding. Totally blew <laughs> everyone's mind. <laughs> So after this amazing work that Edwin Hubble did, scientists launched a telescope and named it in honor of him, the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'm absolutely certain that everybody here has heard of this amazing telescope. And one of the projects that the Hubble Space Telescope continued was exactly what Hubble started. It looked at distant galaxies and it determined how fast they were moving. And the data, in this figure that I'm showing here is encompassed, Hubble's data is just that first tiny little bit of this figure. So the Hubble Space Telescope has shown that further and further away, it is still true that the galaxies are moving further, uh, faster away from us. So the only explanation for this is that the universe is expanding. And so in an expanding universe, you no longer have to hold the universe up from collapsing under gravity. 
and we don't need a cosmological constant. Einstein called this the biggest blunder of his career. He struck it from the record. He's looking pretty sad there. Poor Einstein. Well, there's two ways that uh, an expanding universe could behave over time. On the left, I'm showing an expanding universe <clears throat> that expands for some time after the Big Bang here in the past and eventually collapses in on itself under its own gravity at some time in the future. And we call that the Big Crunch. So that's one possibility if there's enough stuff in the universe that the universe would eventually collapse in on itself because of gravity. Another possibility is an expanding universe that keeps expanding forever, but expands slower and slower. That is a universe that starts out expanding quite quickly after the Big Bang, but gravity tends to slow the universe's expansion down. An analogy I want to use for that is our very own Voyager over here. This was launched some 40 years ago. Not this one. This is a model, of course, <laughs> uh, by JPL. And it left the Earth's gravity, and it eventually left the solar system a few years ago. So the Voyager, like this expanding universe, is going to keep moving away from us forever, but it's always slowing down. And it's always slowing down because the sun is always tugging on it a little bit. So in this expanding universe here, we have an expansion that's slowing down under the force of gravity. So I'm going to use another analogy here. And I swear this was full before the, uh, before the show. But the expanding universe that eventually collapses in on itself is like this. You throw it up, and it comes down. That's how we know gravity works in our daily lives. So that's this character here. This is the expanding universe that collapses in on itself under gravity. The second fella or woman here that's throwing a ball is throwing the ball that's going to keep going away, but slower and slower. That's the other expanding universe, an expanding universe that expands forever, but is slowing down the whole time. So in the 1990s, there were two groups at the same time in the world trying to understand which of these scenarios was correct and how fast the universe was expanding and how fast it had expanded in the past. And both of those groups found an answer. And that answer was a universe that looked like this, a universe that was expanding but faster and faster. Much like Hubble's mind was blown, cosmologists' minds were blown in the uh, 1990s when they realized that the universe did not have an expansion that was slowing down due to gravity. It had an expansion that was speeding up due to something else. And so we have to have a third diagram. And this is the diagram that we think represents what's really happening in our universe. That's a universe that started out at a big bang. It started out expanding somewhat slowly. And as time has gone on, it's expanded faster and faster and faster. And it looks like it's going to keep expanding faster and faster in the future. So we don't know why that is. And we gave the name of whatever's causing that dark energy. So another way to put it is dark energy is the name we gave to our ignorance of whatever is causing this ever-increasing uh, rate of expansion of the universe. So now we have a universe that is not only expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion. So something needs to happen to Einstein's field equation in order to accommodate this accelerating expansion. And it turns out that this can be accounted for in the form of Einstein's original cosmological constant. And scientists were able to add this back into Einstein's field equation in the form of dark energy. <laughs> Einstein's biggest blunder went on to win a Nobel Prize in physics in 2011 for dark energy. So what a triumph. And as you'll notice up here, I've said that the cosmological constant may not be a constant. So scientists still don't really know very much about dark energy at all. And 
theorists are coming up with different ideas all the time about what dark energy might be. And there's no evidence that says that it does or does not have to be a, a constant. It could change over time. And so it's really important for scientists to investigate dark energy in the future to try and understand more about what's going on. So we've talked a little bit about dark energy and dark matter, but how do they work together in the universe? On the one hand, we've got dark energy, and it's this kind of repulsive force that's pushing things apart, while dark matter is an attractive force. It's bringing things together. Dark energy affects the speed at which the universe expands, and we now know that the universe is accelerating in its expansion, while dark matter affects how clustered objects like galaxies are. Dark energy causes everything to move away from everything else, while dark matter causes objects like galaxies to want to move toward one another. So there's this real push and pull going on between dark matter and dark energy in the universe. And so scientists need to investigate the universe over time in order to see what's going on with the clustering and the expansion of the universe over time to try and understand more about both dark matter and dark energy. So how are we going to measure dark energy in the future? Well, it turns out that gravitational lensing technique that we talked about earlier is one of the primary ways we're going to measure dark energy in the future. And so on the left here, I'm showing a very stylized view of how this gravitational lensing works. We've got these distant galaxies, and you can sort of see the ghostly dark matter. And as the light from those distant galaxies comes to us through that dark matter, the shapes of those galaxies are changed. And again, this is an exaggeration. We don't usually see shape changes this strong, and the shape changes occur over very, very long time periods, so we wouldn't see it changing like this. This is just to give you an idea of how we're measuring that dark matter. And what we do is we look at the dark matter at different times in the history of the universe, and this tells us how the dark matter is evolving. So one of the things that we did about 10 years ago, some of my colleagues and I, is we used the Hubble Space Telescope to make the map of the dark matter in a very tiny area of the sky. And we looked very far away, and we were able to make a dark matter map of the dark matter in that area of the sky as it appeared about six and a half billion years ago. And then we looked a little bit closer, and the way we do that is distant galaxies, the light takes some time to reach us, and so the further out we look, the further back in the universe we're looking. So we looked at the dark matter map about 5 billion years ago, and then we looked at the dark matter map about 3.5 billion years ago. And in doing so, we created a three-dimensional map of the dark matter in this tiny area of the sky. And when I say a tiny area of the sky, it was about 2 square degrees on the sky. Well, what does that mean? The whole sky is about 40,000 square degrees. So we looked at about 1 2,000th, or less than, uh, about less than 1 20th of a percent of the sky, a very small amount of the sky, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And what we were able to show is that the clustering of this dark matter changed over time. And it changed over a time in a way that's given by the attractive force of gravity wanting to pull the dark matter together and the repulsive nature of the dark energy wanting to push things apart. So by using this gravitational lensing technique, we can study both the dark matter and the dark energy. And that's what we're going to do in the 2020s. There's three primary telescopes that we're going to use in the 2020s to do this gravitational lensing technique to study dark matter and dark energy. The first is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This is an eight-meter ground-based telescope. Eight meters is the length uh, or the, the diameter of the mirror. And keep in mind that for a telescope, the diameter of the mirror is what is uh, driving the power of the telescope because it determines how many photons, how much light that telescope can collect. And there's about 24 uh, international contributors, 24 countries helping the U.S. build and eventually operate this large synoptic survey telescope 
There's about 900 people worldwide working on the dark energy planning, planning for the dark energy survey with this LSST. A second mission is a space mission from the European Space Agency called Euclid. Now, when we measure the expansion of the universe, scientists say we're measuring the geometry or shape of the universe. And you might remember Euclid is the father of geometry. So that's how this Euclid mission got its name. We plan to launch this Euclid mission into space in 2022. And there's about 1,500 people working on Euclid around the world to do a dark matter and dark energy experiment. And the final uh, experiment we're going to talk about tonight is WFIRST, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. This is a NASA telescope that's going to be launched in 2025, and it's going to do investigations into dark energy and dark matter. And it's also going to look for exoplanets. These are planets outside of our solar system. And I mentioned those uh, earlier that there might be more than 10 billion trillion planets in the universe, and we want to find some of those with W first. Oh, okay. Still me. So I'm going to talk a, a bit more about W first. So W first is a telescope that's going to be launched into space. It's got a, meter, a mirror that's 2.4 meters across. So for those of you that know your space telescopes, that's the same size as the mirror on the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the one that we use to do this dark matter study on a very tiny area of the sky about 10 years ago. And so you might ask, why didn't we just use the Hubble Space Telescope to look at more of the sky? And the reason is it takes too long to do this with the Hubble Space Telescope. And the reason we can do it uh, with W first in the future is because of w first really powerful camera. I'm showing here the Andromeda galaxy. That's the galaxy nearest our own Milky Way. It's about two and a half million light years away. And this is a picture taken from the ground. And a few years ago, one of our colleagues decided she wanted to study the individual stars in the Andromeda galaxy. And to do that, she used the Hubble Space Telescope. And she pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at this galaxy about 400 times to cover about half the galaxy because the Hubble Space Telescope has a pretty small camera. So it took 400 pointings of the Hubble Space Telescope to look at this galaxy. It takes two with W first. So we're going to do the same types of studies of dark matter that were possible with the Hubble Space Telescope, but hundreds or even thousands of times faster with W first. And that's the power that WFIRST is going to unleash. It's a Hubble Space Telescope uh, quality instrument, but with a much bigger camera due to advances in creating detectors and pixels. So Jason's talked about the WFIRST camera. And let's compare the WFIRST camera to the camera on the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. But first, to give you some context again. The camera on your cell phone is maybe about 8 million pixels or 8 megapixels. The camera on WFIRST is around 300 megapixels. And the camera on the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is around 3,000 megapixels or 3 gigapixels. So this is just enormous. And what scientists are going to use this camera for is every five nights they will take a picture of the entire southern sky. And they will do this for 10 years. <coughs> so this is going to give scientists an incredibly deep image of the universe. But it's also going to be like taking a movie of how the sky is changing over time. This is going to be incredible data for the scientists to investigate dark matter and dark energy. And Jason mentioned earlier that it takes a lot of scientists to try to understand this unknown 95% of the universe. And the Euclid Space Telescope, some of the scientists got together earlier this year in summer in Helsinki in Finland and we were working together getting ready for the Euclid Space Telescope which will be the first telescope entirely dedicated to investigating dark matter and dark energy. 
and we took a photo of ourselves to commemorate the moment. And here is Jason and I. <laughs> and uh, notice Jason is not looking at the camera because he's looking at his phone doing emails. <laughs> this is also what it's like being married to a cosmologist. So I looked at this photo and I realized something interesting. These are the scientists from Pasadena who attended this meeting. And I worked out that the scientists from Pasadena make up the 5% normal portion <laughs> of the scientists in Euclid. So maybe you're asking why are we doing three different experiments to investigate the same thing in the 2020s? And it's a good question, and we get asked it a lot. So dark energy, I think I've told you, we, we really don't know what it is. Scientists have no idea. I think you now know as much as I do about dark energy. You can pick up your PhD at the door. <laughs> and so in order to try to understand what's going on with this, uh, this really difficult concept, it takes uh, a lot of different investigations. And so it's really useful to be able to cross-check between the different experiments to understand what's going on. And each of the experiments that Jason and I have talked about this evening have their own uh, special skills, and they're highly complementary with each other. So the Euclid Space Telescope is going to be in space which means it's above the Earth's atmosphere. And Jason told you that we want to measure the shapes of the distant galaxies. I'm sure you've all heard about the song Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. On Earth, stars twinkle because the light from those stars is traveling through the atmosphere of the Earth, and that's causing them to twinkle. But if you get outside of the atmosphere, then those stars are very precise. And so getting outside of the atmosphere enables scientists to measure the shapes of these galaxies very precisely. And Euclid is going to do this over a very wide area, 20,000 square degrees. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, however, is on the ground. So they have to deal with the atmosphere when they're trying to measure these shapes. However, LSST is going to measure the entire southern sky Every, night, uh, every five nights for 10 years, which will enable incredibly deep images of the universe. We'll be looking much, much further back in time. And so we're getting the uh, evolution of what's going on with the dark matter and dark energy over time. And finally, WFIRST, which will launch in 2025, has been designed to be the most precise camera. It's going to take the sharpest images and it will take the deepest images as well. So by combining and comparing these three experiments, scientists are going to be able to make sure that we really understand what's going on and confirm any new exciting discoveries. So we've told you a bit about how we're going to measure dark energy and dark matter in the 2020s. And you still might wonder, well, why do we want to measure that? Well, I think, honestly, for Alina and I and a lot of our colleagues, is we're curious. We want to understand how the universe works. But for everybody, I think you probably want to know what's going to happen in the universe in the future. And really, the future of the universe, how the universe evolves over time in the coming tens of billions of years, is going to be determined by the properties of dark energy, and we just don't know those properties very well. We think that there's probably two scenarios that might play out, and that's what we think now, and we're not sure which one of those two scenarios will play out, and we want to uh, study the dark matter and the dark energy to find out which one of those scenarios will play out. We're going to tell you a little bit about those two possible scenarios now. So if dark energy isn't too strong, Galaxies will continue moving away from each other, like Edwin Hubble discovered. And they're going to continue moving away from each other faster and faster until eventually 
they'll be so far apart that they won't be able to see each other and the universe will become an incredibly lonely place and our galaxy will be alone. Jason, where did you go? I can't see you. Don't worry, I'm here. <laughs> yes. So that's what the universe is going to end up looking like. We'll have a universe where we're in our galaxy and we can't see those distant galaxies anymore. They've moved too far away. And so sometimes uh, I've tried in the past uh, to use this in my funding proposals to NASA. I say, you've really got to fund this uh, dark energy study right now because eventually I'm not going to be able to see these distant galaxies if you don't send me the money. And it doesn't work anymore because I think uh, my colleagues at NASA headquarters have realized that this happens many, many tens of billions of years from now. So they think I have plenty of time to measure uh, before this happens. And so we've told you about a lonely end, uh, a possible lonely end, uh, kind of a sad end maybe, to the universe. But it's not the scariest possible end to the universe. So Alina and I, uh, full disclosure, we do not have a pool. We told you that earlier. But we do have a fire pit. So in honor of Halloween, we want you to all come sit with us around the campfire. And we're going to tell you a scary story about another possible future of the universe. So if dark energy is a bit stronger than scientists currently believe, then the universe will eventually end. At around 60 million years before the end of the universe, galaxies will begin to rip apart. So unlike the scenario we talked about earlier where the galaxy remained together, in this scenario, dark energy becomes so strong that it starts to fling the stars away inside galaxies. At about three months before the end of the universe, in this scenario, <laughs> even solar systems are going to get ripped apart. That is, planets are going to be shot away from their stars because of the ever-increasing expansion of the universe. Now, uh, it's not quite as scary as you might think for us because long before that happens, our sun will turn into a red giant star and gobble up the Earth. So I hope I made you feel a lot better about this uh, end of the universe scenario. At a few minutes before the end of the universe, even stars and planets will begin to get ripped apart by how strong the dark energy has become and stretching out the universe. In the final moments of the universe, even atoms are going to be ripped apart. That is, electrons are going to be ripped from the nucleus, and protons and neutrons are going to be ripped apart. And in fact, we think the very fabric of space will start to rip apart in what we call a big rip. So these are... <laughs> Yes, scientists are very, very clever with our naming, huh? <laughs> Everything's big or dark. Uh, these are the two possible scenarios that scientists think might happen uh, with dark energy. And I don't find either of them particularly happy, a very lonely end or the universe being ripped apart. Fortunately, this is not going to happen for uh, many, many billions of years. And we've got a lot of time to study the dark matter and study the dark energy and find out which scenario might happen. And of course, humans are pretty ingenious. And uh, maybe in the coming billions of years, we can use that ingenuity to figure out how to harness the dark matter and dark energy and uh, control the universe uh, maybe for a happier fate. <laughs> So Jason and I really want to thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. It has been an incredible privilege for us to talk to you about the dark universe and we would be delighted to take some of your questions. Thank you all. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank Preston. No, you put this all together. I helped yeah. out. I did a few things. Uh, you guys can go ahead and head towards center stage here, and we'll get set up for our Q&A. Um, 
so yeah, you guys can wander on over there. Uh, that was a really great talk because I think a, a lot of us find these topics really mysterious and we don't even, uh, we, we need that kind of primer to help us get just our basic bearings on something so mysterious. Um, well, uh, now it's time for your questions. Uh, if you have one, please come to the microphone. I see fo some folks lining up uh, in the center there. So uh, if you submitted one on the YouTube chat, we'll get to a couple of those as well. So we're all set now. Go ahead with your question. Thanks. Um, if all mass has gravity and all matter has mass, do you know any way to figure out how much mass and gravity dark matter has? So we were asked, do we know any way to figure out how much mass and gravity dark matter has? And the answer is yes. We know only one way to figure out how much mass uh, dark matter has. And that's through this gravitational lensing technique that I talked about tonight. That's our only way of measuring the dark matter because it doesn't give off light and it doesn't absorb light. So we have to look at it indirectly through its effect on these distant galaxies. So that's the technique we use to figure out how much mass dark matter has. All right, so I actually have two questions. One, do you take interns? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Absolutely. Okay, and starting in December, contact one of us. All right, uh, and number two, how does the heat death theory factor into all of this? I, I don't know the answer to oh. that, so I'm going to give it to Jason. <laughs> so heat death theory says that uh, stars will eventually burn out. They'll burn their, uh, burn their fuel up, and the uh, eventually will become universe will become colder and colder and colder and 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 uh, more diffuse and more diffuse and that's the uh, future of the universe that we thought might happen before we discovered the uh, dark energy so that's a future of the universe that this ever expanding universe that was expanding slower and slower and slower it just kind of peter out but with the dark energy we think there's likely different scenarios uh, for the future of the universe. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you want to, if you want to look into internships, go to the JPL website. You can uh, find information there. We do take interns. Um, so, if we're looking at the universe and the universe is looking at us, what's the probability of the universe just staying the same? So, the question is, uh, we're looking at the universe, and the universe is looking at us, and what is the probability of it staying the same? So. Scientists, as they're looking at the universe right now, we're watching it change all the time because light has a finite um, velocity. So we are looking further back in time as we look out into the distant universe. And so the probability of it staying the same is zero. We're watching it change all the time. OK. Thank you. Thank you. So I was wondering if you could uh, clarify the effects of gravitational lensing I've heard it, uh, the, uh, different effects attributed to it, such as magnifying uh, uh, stars or galaxies far beyond the amount that we could get through our telescopes if it wasn't aided by gravitational lensing. I've also seen in the slides you've shown here are some types of spherical aberration, which highly distorts the image. And then uh, I've even seen a few decades ago examples where there were literally mirror images of uh, galaxies in formations like reflected upon each other. I don't really understand how all those things happen. Perhaps you could tie it together for us. Sure. So the, the question is about um, what we scientists call strong gravitational lensing, where light from a distant galaxy is traveling towards us, and it is being distorted by a huge amount of dark matter. And that light is traveling quite close to the large amount of dark matter, which is causing a large lensing effect. And one, uh, in, in physics, we can look at how light deflects as it goes through this dark matter. And these are quite simple equations uh, to, to understand. But uh, we expect to see a number of different galaxies in this strong gravitational uh, lensing. So multiple images is one of the consequences of this strong gravitational lensing. And you can sometimes even do this with a wine glass and some water. It's the same kind of effect of the light traveling through when you're looking at the reflections. Uh, 
of the light going through the glass. And so all of the things that you mentioned, the giant arcs, the multiple images, the magnification, they're consequences of uh, strong gravitational lensing. Do you want to? Yeah, I, you had mentioned multiple images of the same galaxy. And uh, a way, way to think of that is if, if you have a, a very strong lens here, a lot of dark matter, and the galaxy back here, some of the light is going to come this way. It's going to come to your eye. Some of the light is going to come that way to your eye. And what your eye is going to see is an image of that distant galaxy here and here. So we can get multiple images of the distant galaxy from this gravitational lensing effect. And that was one of the surprising things that uh, people started to discover when we started to have the quality of images that we get from the Hubble Space Telescope. So then the effect depends on the line of sight and the relative position of the dark energy or? That, that's exactly right. It depends on the line of sight uh, and the, the relative positions of the dark matter and the distant galaxy. So we know something about where the, the dark matter is in clumps relative to uh, the totality of space? We do know where the dark matter is because we can back that out using these equations when we see these gravitational lenses. So it's using these gravitational lenses, that's how we measure where the dark matter is and how much there is. Does it correlate with any other visible objects in the known universe? The position of the dark matter, it turns out it correlates quite well usually with the position of the luminous matter, the normal matter, the stuff we see. And that's because the dark matter forms sort of a well where the normal matter collects. It's like a gravitational well. The normal matter collects where there's a lot of dark matter. OK, we're going to move on to Thank one you. of our questions from YouTube. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, SS Art 98 has a good one uh, uh, for cosmologists. If the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? That's a classic. It's a, it's a real classic question. So, if the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? And the, the very unsatisfying answer is that the universe is really everything. So it is, there's nothing outside it. It's just getting bigger. <laughs> Sorry, do you have a better way of saying it? <laughs> We're just getting more universe. <laughs> It's, uh, it's something that's very difficult for our minds to, to get around because we can only think in the, the three dimensions we see. Uh, but the universe uh, is expanding. It's getting uh, bigger. And there's more universe uh, today than there was yesterday. And uh, tomorrow it's going to be even bigger. So you heard it here. <laughs> You're getting more Big Bang for your buck. <laughs> Next question. It's actually what my question was going to be. Okay. Uh, but you don't consider it the big void or some infinite haze that this is all expanding into? You, that's not part of your study, not part of your consideration? So it's not in the, in the following sense, is that we think uh, if we look at how the universe has evolved, we can watch that sort of backwards as a movie in reverse. And eventually we get back to an infinitely dense and infinitely small point in the past, about 13 some billion years ago. And after that, it, that, there was a big bang and it started to expand. And so it doesn't mean at that point was sitting in space. All of space was at an infinitesimally small point and we're just getting more space. Uh, it's something that uh, as cosmologists, we learn to understand the equations and the equations fit our observations. But as humans, it's pretty hard to get our mind around that because it's not something we can visualize very easily. Or multiple dimensions, I suppose. That's another possible right. explanation. But for me, I can't think in multiple dimensions either. Thank Just you. the math. I can only see the math. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hi there. Hi. So uh, by the way, what would happen if the universe keeps on with this accelerating expansion? Would it one day expand faster than light speed? So yes, the universe will eventually be expanding faster than light speed. So nothing in the universe uh, can itself, no piece of matter, no piece of light can move faster than light. But space can expand faster than the speed of light. Right, so what if the space between each of the individual matter molecules and stuff 
all of that starts expanding faster than light. Does that mean that no molecule will be able to touch each other? Like no particle will be able to touch each other because no, nothing could really move faster than light. That's one of the possible scenarios that we talked about at the end, that uh, we can't see anything else because it's all moved uh, uh, faster than light away from us. And is there a chance that the dark matter, dark energy phenomenon that we're observing is possibly just the curvature of space-time itself, but instead of being curved by the stuff that we can't see, it's curved by something that we don't know, or it's just curved to begin with? So the question was, is the dark matter and dark energy just a curvature of space-time? Right. Well, we describe gravity as the curvature of space-time. That's how we describe gravity with our gravity equations that Alina was talking about in the talk. Uh, and in fact, um, that it's, it's equivalent to what you described. Uh, so it might be that we don't understand gravity very well. We think we do, but if we don't, that could explain some I mean, of the right things now, we, we see. We have trouble even putting gravity into particle physics. That's true. Mm -hmm. We don't have a complete uh, uh, model of particle physics that includes gravity. All right, on to another question from you two. Jane wants to know if ordinary particles can become dark matter. So, can ordinary particles become dark matter? And I would say that uh, the answer to that that scientists currently believe is no. We have normal matter that we understand and, and it reflects uh, electromagnetic light and it emits uh, radiation, but I don't think that we think it can turn into dark matter, but that doesn't mean that something couldn't be discovered in the future, because we don't know all that much about it. Hey. I am clearly the dumbest person in this room, <laughs> as this question will prove. I want to follow you and I'm mostly there. But if I understand what you're saying, there's a distortion that we're seeing, and so we're assuming it's dark matter? Is there any other theories? Or does the math just say, nope, that's it? So we're seeing these gravitational lensing distortions, and the question is, are we assuming that this is dark matter, or are there other theories that could explain it? And for a long time, there were lots of scientists that wanted to come up with a modified theory of gravity that didn't need an unseen form of matter. And over time, there were lots of experiments that scientists were undertaking, and they were able to rule out all of these other theories that did not include dark matter. And so at the moment, the only theories that work are the ones that include dark matter. But there's no way to actually detect it or prove it. It's just yes. we're yay, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're working on it. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question. If after the Big Bang, all of this matter, which was essentially, essentially particles, gradually accreted into planets and suns and galaxies and galaxy clusters, and if dark matter is really little particles that we can't see, shouldn't it have done the same thing and shouldn't it be concentrated in all the galaxies and stars? So why, is, why is it in between the galaxies and not in the galaxies? The question is about uh, how the dark matter is, um, is distributed throughout right. the universe. And, um, and uh, I can let you know that uh, the dark matter is actually clustered at the centers of the galaxies. And scientists believe that the density of the dark matter at the center of a galaxy is much higher than the density at the outskirts of the galaxy. And when we do simulations of dark matter with a computer, we get these beautiful um, uh, clustering of the dark matter in what we call a big cosmic web. And where we would expect to see a galaxy, there's this high density of dark matter. And you can trace it along where you expect to see the luminous matter. So really, the luminous matter is falling into the center of these dense dark matter areas. OK, thank you. And one other little anecdote. Is it true that when they discovered that the Hubble constant was wrong and the universe was accelerating, that there was a headline that said, uh, Hubble double, universe in trouble? <laughs> there should have been. <laughs> OK, so Derek on YouTube asks if dark matter has an electrical charge. Do we know enough about it to say that? We do. So dark, an electrical charge comes from the electromagnetic interaction. And so 
Right now, our best guess for dark matter is that it does not interact at all through the electromagnetic interaction. So it has no electric charge. In fact, we think the dark matter only interacts gravitationally. It doesn't interact in any other way. That's what we think right now. So no, no magnetic charge, no electrical charge, uh, just gravity. And was that question, sorry, about dark matter or dark energy? It was about dark matter, yeah. whether the okay. dark matter has the, the charge. So. Perfect. Hi. Hi. So um, my question's about the big rip. If everything is, oh my god, if everything is ripping apart and the atoms get ripped apart, wouldn't that create energy that would then bring it all together and we would have like a big suck and then another big bang and then just start all over again? You can take that one. Uh, you can take it. So the question is, uh, wouldn't a big rip create energy that might uh, start everything all over again? And uh, I, earlier I said, well, I, I can't uh, visualize an expanding universe into something. It's just the equations. And I can tell you that uh, the problem there is that once we get to this big rip, our equations don't work very well anymore. So I don't have an intuition uh, from the equations that tell me what's going to happen after that. Uh, so I don't know yeah, what happens after the big rip. He was uh, trying to get me to say, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. How's that? <laughs> and it's that way at the beginning of the universe as well as the end, right? We don't That's right. At the... At the time of the Big Bang, our equations don't work very well, and, and it's only after the Big Bang that the equations start to work. So there's still, there's still uh, uh, work we have to do. And uh, don't forget, we did start this talk by saying that 95% of the universe cosmologists, people who study the universe, don't understand. So we stood in front of uh, uh, several hundred people and said, we don't understand 95% of what we do in our job. <laughs> and they're OK with that. Yeah. So time for a couple more questions. Go ahead. I just had a question. On, <laughs> I just just had a question on axions. Um, what, in your view, is like the hypothetical particle that dark matter or dark energy consists of, like neutralinos, um, wimps, or what? What? Uh, could, if you could expand on that, thanks. You're a plant from Caltech, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you asked, what do we think dark matter is? And right now, uh, the, uh, the theorists on this are somewhat unconstrained by the data. And what I mean by that is... <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> do I have any dark matter theorists here? Who are gonna... um, uh, so what it means is there's a lot of theories, and you mentioned a few. There's axions. Uh, there's WIMPs. Uh, we're pretty clever at, at naming things. There's another one called Machos. Uh, I'm, I'm more partial to that than the WIMPs, I guess. But uh, these are all different um, uh, theories of what the dark matter uh, particle is. And in fact, the one that's been pretty well ruled out is the Machos, unfortunately. Uh, but what we're doing with the, uh, the gravitational lensing experiments is we're starting to rule out what I'd call different classes of models and uh, because they behave somewhat differently. Uh, and when we get better and better data, we can rule out different classes of dark matter particles. But there's still a lot of possibilities left. And that's why we need to do these experiments like LSST, Euclid, and W first in the future. All right, future NASA intern, you get to have our last question of the night. OK. So I had another question. You said that, uh, I, while answering your previous question, you said that uh, dark matter um, concentrates at the centers of galaxies. Would that have any relation to black holes? Because black holes are theorized, from what I've heard, to have infinite mass. No, they don't have infinite mass. They have finite mass, but it's infinite. Now we have two interns. Yeah, no, clearly. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> so the question was, uh, is the dark matter at the center of galaxies related to the, um, the black holes at the center of galaxies? And so black holes are something very different to dark matter. Black holes are what uh, come about when, when stars, uh, very massive stars, reach the end of their lives. And then uh, there's some uh, coalescing of 
black holes at the centre of galaxies to make these supermassive black holes. And we can measure the mass of these black holes, actually. Uh, and, uh, and as was very helpfully mentioned, they, um, they have a finite mass but an infinite sort of density. And so the light can't escape from that mass. And so they're unrelated to the dark matter in the center of those galaxies. All right, thank you. So they're dark matter, but they're not dark matter. Right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's all the time we have uh, for this. And we can, we can uh, have some we'll discussion for a while, right after so the show, can, and yeah. we come on up and, and we can continue this discussion. But for our audience at home, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you again to our speakers. Please join, us, uh, please join us next month for our show all about how we use the uh, International Space Station to study our home planet from above. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah, sure. I have a quick question. The furthest objects that we can see with our telescopes are traveling fast.